Coastal Commission. And um, uh, Dr. Lester, we're pleased uh, that you're here today, and uh, thank you for um, uh, what we anticipate will be interesting testimony. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I'm very happy to be here today. And uh, honorable committee members, um, I am happy to be here today to talk about what I think is one of the critical issues for our time and coming generations. Um, in my uh, 20 minutes here, I hope to tell you a short story that by the end of which you have an appreciation of uh, a couple of things, both the significance, experience, and knowledge that the Coastal Commission already has in this issue area, but also the tremendous challenges that we face going forward and the need that we all work together on these challenges, um, and particularly many of us in this room today. Uh, and just a, a brief setting of the context, uh, similar to BCDC, uh, over 40 years ago, Californians uh, decided and recognized the incredible value of our coast and decided that and realized that without comprehensive state planning and regulation of development, we might stand to lose those values. And so we've been uh, establishing a legacy in our state that's recognized nationally, uh, whereby we've protected many of these areas that you see there. We've protected our wetlands, including our urban wetlands, like Batiquitos Lagoon. And we've had huge success with public access and recreation, uh, protecting thousands of access ways and opening up access in places like Carbon Beach and Malibu. And overall, I think the record shows that you can have a strong resource protection regulatory program and a strong economy. Our coast and ocean economy is estimated at over $40 billion a year. The beach economy alone is estimated by some at $14 billion, $73 billion to the national economy. In one survey, Californians' willingness to pay for protecting their beach was estimated at $25 billion a year. So there are huge dollar values associated with our coastal zone. The success that we've had has been built around a couple of things. One is our recognition of the necessary and critical role of land use planning in managing the coastal uh, land-sea interface. But the other key uh, component has been that we have incredible partnerships that we need to continue to support. We have 61 coastal cities in California. We have 15 coastal counties. Taken together, they all uh, are involved in our local coastal planning program, and currently about 85% of our coast is governed by local coastal plans approved by the Coastal Commission in partnership with these local governments. Overlaying that, we have a, an acknowledgement of the uh, extreme importance of public participation, and we have a very active citizenry for 40 years in our coastal program. And, of course, we have many agencies at the state and federal level involved in this many in the room today that are critical to these partnerships and making the program work. So let me go over a, a, what seem, may seem to be obvious and what we're talking about today, water levels. And water levels determine values that we're concerned about and that we've been protecting. So this strip in between the ocean and the land where the water levels have an effect is what we're talking about in large part. Water levels determine the types and locations of our wetlands and other sensitive resources. They determine and shape our beaches, how they look and where they are. And they also determine what kinds of development we can do and how we can do it. So a brief primer on what the Coastal Commission's framework is for dealing with this issue. As you know, most development in the coastal zone must get a permit for uh, development either from the commission or local government. It has to be consistent with the statewide policies of the Coastal Act or local coastal programs that were approved by the commission. Local governments must prepare these local coastal programs and that's what really determines what kinds of development can occur where, when, and at what intensities. <clears throat> in terms of this specific issue of hazards management and sea level rise, we have two core policies. For new development, the Coastal Act says minimize risks to life and property and do not require the construction of shoreline protection devices. And that's what I'm going to focus on the rest of this talk is shoreline protection. Uh, the second main policy is for existing development. The Coastal Act essentially grandfathered in what was termed existing development and said in, in certain circumstances existing development could get a seawall or a shoreline protective device. So in terms of new development, the main approach that we've taken over the years is to ask that new development be set back to be safe for its economic life. And here you see an example from the city of Pismo Beach, 
where on the right there's a subdivision that was required to be set back to be safe from erosion. On the left, you see a pre-coastal act development pattern, and you can see the obvious difference. And you also see a seawall at the toe of the uh, bluff there in front of that development. Now, most LCPs that the Commission has certified typically require this new development to be safe for its economic life. They have ranges of 50 or 100 years defined as what that life is. And then they have LCP setback policies that tell you where to put the new development. Uh, so, for example, um, 13 LCPs now have require, uh, require specific consideration of sea level rise in their setback determinations. In Crescent City, we recently approved an LCP amendment that says plan for three to six feet of sea level rise in that area over the next century. But another critical thing to understand about this, um, this challenge is that there's a lot of uncertainty, geologic uncertainty and analytic uncertainty with how you determine what the erosion rates are. So depending on your approach and what data you have, you can get a differing setbacks. In Pismo Beach, again, here's a, a site where the Cliffs Hotel was ultimately approved by the Coastal Commission with a setback that was determined to be safe for its economic life. However, about 15 years ago, an emergency revetment was placed uh, on the site here uh, in the perception that the development was in danger. The Coastal Commission looked at that and actually determined it wasn't in danger and required the revetment to be removed. <clears throat> and it's still not there, and, we, and the development is um, safe for the time being. This is another site in the city of Pacifica, <clears throat> which shows you the varying uh, episodic erosion that you can also see along bluff lines. And the key here is to recognize that planning is important because, and this is this site from another uh, viewpoint, episodic erosion can happen really quickly. In the space of a, about a week in 2009-10, the Land's End Pacifica Apartments lost up to 90 feet of erosion in this location. This is what Land's End looked like soon after it was built. It was authorized before the Coastal Act was uh, approved. You see the large setback here. This is that area that you just saw fall away. And this is what it looks like today after um, considerable erosion and this a large seawall that the Commission recently approved. You can also see that the bluff had already started to fall uh, and erode on top of the seawall soon after it was built. This is another slide showing the range of uncertainty we're talking about with setbacks. This is in Sand City, and depending on your assumptions about erosion rates, there's a huge band of land here that's potentially subject to erosion, which makes siting new development challenging. So one of the things the Commission has done over the years is develop its geologic expertise and uh, put in place refined methods for determining what setbacks should be. We've also used the regulatory process effectively to essentially require that landowners assume the risks of their development in hazardous locations. Uh, this includes assumptions of risk, waivers of liability against the state, and indemnification provisions. Uh, most critically, for the last 15 years, the Commission has been requiring something called a no future seawall condition, which says uh, you can build here, but you agree to assume the risk, and you also agree to waive any rights that you may have to a shoreline structure in the future. The idea here is that we will build in safe development over time and self-enforcing planned retreat because there will not be a time in the future when a seawall could be built. This is an example of a, a house that has yet to redevelop, but the Commission put all of these conditions on this house here. You can see that it's a hazardous location with undermining of the bluff under the house. The thing I like about this photo is that it also shows you some incredible habitat values that we find along our eroding shorelines. These are nesting birds here. So in terms of sea level rise, as, you, as you've heard, these erosion uh, issues will merely be exacerbated and accelerated by sea level rise, making it that much more challenging. And that brings me to the other side of the equation. What do we do about existing development? And we have a huge uh, body of experience dealing with revetments, seawalls, and other kinds of shoreline structures to deal with erosion. We've analyzed the impacts. In 1995, we concluded that impacts like this have resulted in a cumulative impact of 25 acres of beach being covered in Monterey Bay. That's just Monterey Bay. We know that sand supply is trapped behind seawalls. This is the huge slug of sand that you just saw a minute ago fall away from Land's End. 
it, it created a large beach at this location for a while, and then it went on into the system, nourishing other beaches down coast. We know that seawalls block lateral access. Here's the wall, and here's the access that you can no longer use. And that's one of the most significant impacts that we're confronting with seawall development. The narrowing and eventual loss of a beach in front of a hardened shoreline. And this dynamic is really um, well documented. Uh, Dr. Gary Griggs has written about it, who spoke to you earlier in your um, series of hearings. A beach naturally wants to retreat. If it's able to do so, it will maintain its width. If it's blocked, it will get smaller over time. So the beach on the left moves inland, the beach on the right disappears. Here's another example of the difference in beach width and between a seawall and no seawall. With the loss of beach also comes the loss of beach ecology in that particular uh, habitat. Seawalls are also uh, not necessarily pretty. This, is, this melange is one of my favorites from Westcliff Drive in the city of Santa Cruz. So to deal with these kinds of impacts, the Commission has developed many different uh, mitigation measures over the years. One of its most important has been dealing with um, the loss of beach access and recreation in front of seawalls. In the case of Ocean Harbor House in the city of Monterey, a pre-coastal act condominium built on the beach. Uh, we approved a seawall, but we also required a $5.3 million fee to go to providing beach access recreation in the vicinity. We've also uh, gotten very good at asking people to design seawalls to look and feel like a natural bluff. This is a pleasure point seawall, uh, actually approximating the two different kinds of geology, rock formations and sea caves that form along that section of coast. And this is also uh, protecting an incredibly important public access way up top. We've also been good about making sure that revetments aren't put in place unnecessarily. Here was again an emergency revetment at the Ritz-Carlton Half Moon Bay. The commission ordered that it be taken out because it was not necessary to protect an existing structure. The commission has also been working closely with Caltrans to deal with uh, hazards to uh, important infrastructure, most notably Highway 1, such as in Gleason's Beach, Pescadero, and at Pedras Blancas in San Luis Obispo County. This Pedras Blancas project we started about 15 years ago, and we asked Caltrans to look at realignment of Highway 1 so that it could survive another 100 years without the need for shoreline protection. And this is the proposed alignment here. We're very close to moving forward on that project, uh, and it's a, a great testament to what you can do by planning ahead and realizing well, what the options are for um, retreat in this case. The Commission recently denied a proposal to uh, expand the Morro Bay Wastewater Treatment Plant out of concerns for flooding and coastal hazards. We're now back in the planning loop with the City and, and the Regional Board as to where to locate a uh, wastewater treatment plant going forward. We asked the City of Daly City to look at alternatives for relocating this landfill that's immediately along the coast and protected by a revetment. But one of our biggest challenges has to do with the reality that most of the urban development patterns that we have were inherited before our Coastal Act. So this is typical for California. 1943, 1967, huge post-World War II development boom, setting in place a, a pattern that we are now struggling with. So we have to ask ourselves, are these urban areas really capable of retreating, or are we going to have to deal with them with hardening the shoreline? We know that Coastal development is valuable, and it's going to continue to redevelop. So here's what happens typically along our coastline. Structures don't go away. They get bigger, stronger. And we also have to come to terms with our redevelopment rules. At the very moment that the Coastal Commission was working with this landowner to require a redevelopment of the property to be located further inland, this property here was redeveloping under the redevelopment rules applied to essentially become a new house in the same location. And we also have to recognize, I believe, uh, that nature isn't really going to care at one level what we do on some of these things. And Gleason's Beach, you can see, is f these houses are, are um, falling into the ocean, notwithstanding our valiant efforts to protect them down below. This is where Caltrans is already trying to relocate Highway 1 further inland, and it's on the inland side of these houses. 
Again, in the city of Pacifica, these nine houses were uh, in danger. We tried to protect them with a revetment. Uh, notwithstanding that revetment, the houses were red tagged and started to fall into the ocean during extreme storm conditions. They're not there anymore. Thanks to the Coastal Conservancy, we have a nice access way, and we're protecting it with the revetment that was put in place for the homes, but the homes aren't there. So you've heard about our best available science and what's going to happen. We know that it's going to happen no matter what we do with our greenhouse gas emissions. In other words, we must adapt. You've heard about how it's happening now in extreme conditions. We've already seen the impacts up and down California, particularly during these king tide events. So while I would agree with BCDC that this is something that is happening over the long term, it is also already happening, and we need to deal with it, begin dealing with it now. So let me turn to um, the major adaptation challenge that we're facing in urban areas. For example, Solana Beach. In 1989, this stretch had largely no seawalls. Today, it's largely armored. The problem is, because of passive erosion, we're losing the beach in front of that armoring unless we do something else. That something else might be sand replenishment, which is something pursued up and down the coast. It's very expensive, but we, the commission just approved a sand replenishment project from the Army Corps of Engineers for this area. It's going to cost about $63 million over 50 years to maintain the beach. It's unclear how successful that will be. Broad Beach in Malibu is currently struggling with uh, the er eroding beach in front of them. Their beach is getting smaller. It's no longer broad. They have 114 homes. To their credit, they formed a geological hazard abatement district, and they've taken it upon themselves to invest $20 million up front to try to replenish that beach and maintain it. But our issues are um, dramatic in terms of the public resources at risk. These are public access dedications that the Commission has secured over the years at Broad Beach. Are they going to disappear as the sea uh, rises against the revetment that has now been placed here on an emergency basis, which is also sitting, by the way, on top of some of these public easements currently? Port Wainimi, I think, is an illustration of the challenge of emergency response versus trying to get ahead of this and be more proactive. The legislature last year just approved $2 million to Port Wainimi to uh, pay for an emergency revetment along this stretch of coast because the dredging that had been occurring here and that was replenishing this beach is no longer occurring due to lack of federal funding. So that broken replenishment loop has led to the need for the state to pay for emergency response. and that will probably continue. And the question is, do we um, lose our beach in front of that revetment, or do we try to plan for something more uh, protective of the public resources? So uh, let me move to the commission's strategy on this issue. Uh, we recently adopted a strategic plan. A component of that is a comprehensive uh, effort to outline steps to address sea level rise and climate change. Uh, it includes three main objectives, developing permitting and planning guidance, assessing coastal vulnerabilities, and reducing greenhouse emissions through the land use tools that we have available to us. So I'm not going to go through these in details, but it includes uh, a sea level rise guidance that I'll get to in a minute, uh, more specific land use and zoning ordinance guidance for local governments, working with other agencies that are here today and with the resources agency through the Coast and Ocean Working Group, coordinating with resources agency and uh, flood management agencies, emergency management agencies, and also working closely with the State Lands Commission on critical issues dealing with the public trust. And then we have a second objective to address vulnerabilities in key sectors, public access and recreation, wetlands and sensitive habitats, uh, working with the wildlife agencies, working with Caltrans, and finally the greenhouse gas emissions uh, components. On the sea level rise guidance, we're currently midstream on a comprehensive effort to uh, have the commission adopt comprehensive guidance for local governments and project applicants to address sea level rise. So the document itself lays out uh, the, best the best available science uh, around sea level rise. Uh, topics include assessing local risks and impacts, analyzing planning scenarios, identifying adaptation measures, and how to update local coastal programs to deal with this issue. 
These are just diagrams from the document itself, one addressing sea level rise and local coastal plans, uh, six steps in order to get that done. And similarly, the corresponding steps for individual developments. How do you de design and incorporate concern for sea level rise over time into individual developments? But the other core piece of our strategy is to turn back to our core implementation mechanism, which is the LCP program. And as I mentioned, about 85% of the coast is covered by LCPs. But we also know that these uh, LCPs are tremendously out of date. Many of them are decades old, and in addition to not addressing sea level rise, don't address many other important local planning concerns. <clears throat> so the strategic plan of the commission also includes a comprehensive strategy to pursue completion of those LCPs that have never been completed, to work with local governments to update LCPs where feasible, including to address sea level rise, and to continue improving our communication and planning with local government. Again, that critical partnership between the state and local government. The 2009 uh, adaptation strategy that uh, came out of, uh, for the state uh, specifically recognized the importance of amending local coastal plans and general plans to address climate change. The draft Safeguarding California plan, which you'll hear about more later, specifically recognizes that we need to continue to invest in updating LCPs in order to address and reduce risk from sea level rise. But LCP strategies in this planning question are going to be uh, context dependent. So we can talk about whether we should stand and defend through seawalls or do beach replenishment or elevate development or move it back. But, but the options for doing that are really going to depend on the places you're looking at and, and the kinds of development patterns you have. You know, responding to sea level rise in the Port of San Diego is very different than moving a highway back in northern San Luis Obispo County where you have lots of space to do it. So the solution is going to depend on the context and the cost-benefit analysis that you arrive at in those cases. This is just one example, Ventura County, the Oxnard Plain. All of these resources need to be considered and taken into account and what we're going to do about that, the hazards to these resources. So our planning capacity is really critical. And this is just a, a um, simplified graph of the Coastal Commission's uh, general fund budget over time adjusted for inflation. At this time when we were writing LCPs in the early 1980s, we had huge federal grants, lots of federal money coming in to support that planning. We did a lot of planning work. But as you can see, our capacity has diminished relative to uh, inflation over time. So we have been um, actively pursuing a strategy to increase both our capacity and local government capacity to do this kind of planning. Effective collaboration and planning takes time. Those of you from local government know this, that it takes a lot of time and effort to to do the upfront work together, it, it takes community involvement. So we've also been working on a coordinated funding strategy with the OPC and the State Coastal Conservancy for funding grants to local government. And then finally, uh, last year, we were very fortunate to receive a budget augmentation to the commission itself of $3 million and to local government for grants of $1 million. And we were very uh, pleased with that. It's an important investment in our LCP program, and we're hoping to be able to sustain that going forward. Um, just last week, our commission approved the $1 million of LCP planning grants to these com 11 communities. You should know that we had 28 applications requesting over $5.2 million. There's a clear demand for this kind of work, but not enough funding to support it. So we told our commission these were all important grants, all important work but we could only fund some of it. Uh, in the city of LA, for example, we could give $100,000, but they need much more to be able to do what they need to do in places like Venice. Um, I noted an article the other day that Venice is projected, much of Venice is projected to be underwater in, in a short period of time, and there's serious concern about that. So stepping back overall, our, our coastal adaptation strategy from the uh, perspective of the commission involves uh, cent centers around our LCP program and putting in place adaptation planning. It involves vulnerability and technical assessments in these five sectors, and it involves a lot of intergovernmental coordination in all of these sectors. We can't do this without the help of state lands, without the resources agency, without the other actors like, like Caltrans and state parks that are critically involved in this area. So to me, uh, I think the bottom line is we will adapt. 
the question is, or the questions that we need to ask are how do we want to adapt and when are we going to adapt? And then beyond that, how much is it going to cost for these different kinds of potential adaptations and how do we, which public values do we want to uh, keep trying to maintain and keep in place as we adapt? So let me conclude with a couple uh, examples that I find hopeful. Uh, one is the Stillwell Hall in, at Fort Ord in Monterey County. Um, when the Army came in to demolish the old officers club at Fort Ord, uh, the Coastal Commission respectfully asked them to also remove the revetment that they had placed there over the years to protect Stillwell Hall. You can see from this photo the effect that the revetment's having on beach access. There's no lateral access, the beach is covered. Here's the real beach here. But we also know as soon as the Army uh, removed Stillwell Hall and the revetment, the beach restored itself. So we know that nature will take care of itself in, given the right conditions. We also know from this example in the city of Monterey, uh, their window on the bay project, that we can be successful at proactive planning and systematic adaptation over time that doesn't involve emergency response or expensive ad hoc response, but rather systematic planning and investment, but we reach a, a better public outcome. This is a developed area in 1972 uh, between their first public road and the beach area. The city made a systematic commitment over time to opening up that area, and today it's an open public space. They didn't take any private property. They did it through working with landowners. They did it through planning and working with uh, the partners like the Coastal Commission. Um, so, and they were successful. One of the ironies for me here, though, is I don't think they realized they would need this space for a sea level rise. So I, I'm going to wrap up there and make myself available for questions, try to answer your questions. But thank you for the time. Great. Thank you, Dr. Lester. Um, I uh, was serving on the uh, San Mateo County Board of Supervisors representing the city of Pacifica when uh, that erosion occurred. So um, it's kind of a nightmare to see those pictures again. Um, but thank you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Ms. Atkins. Thank you, and I'll try to be quick, but um, in terms of the LCP updates, um, on average, and I know every community is different, the counties, the cities, the areas, on average, what does it cost to update one LCP? That's a good question. Uh, it really depends on the LCP you're looking at. So we have 15 counties, and so San Luis Obispo County, for example, is a long and, and large coastal zone. It might take them uh, several millions of dollars to do an update, and it would take several years at least. Uh, San Mateo County also had a long update process. And that's recognizing that um, there's a local government planning phase which involves a lot of community involvement, out outreach meetings, environmental assessment, development of background studies, all of that is critical to get done, but it can be expensive. And most of that money comes uh, from the state or grants, not necessarily from the local jurisdictions. Have many of them committed some funds? We were um, very happy that, uh, especially the um, grantees that were awarded grants last week, they all provided some kind of significant local match, and that was one of our criteria. So there is um, planning money available at the local government, but we all know that it, they're strapped and they're, it's difficult. So just from a 30,000 foot view, I, I mean, you have been struggling uh, for quite some time to update LCPs and budgetary issues have, always, have been there. So inner sea level rise and the fact that we are finally probably beginning to take this seriously is my feeling. Uh, some of us sooner than, than others, but how many LCPs have we kind of updated without the awareness of sea level rise and incorporating that into the, the framework of that discussion? We've done a few comprehensive updates of LCPs, and maybe a few of those have addressed sea level rise. I mentioned that there are 13 LCPs that uh, specifically mention sea level rise and the need to address it. But that's one kind of update. The other kind of update that we need to begin doing is the comprehensive updated planning, the land use planning. So what are our assets in each community? How are we going to address the threats to them? Uh, are we going to systematically move them back or relocate critical infrastructure? Are we going to build seawalls and try to mitigate for the impacts to public resources otherwise? That's a more intensive kind of planning. And then one, one in the weeds 
quick question. So developing permitting uh, guidelines that address the issue of liability and indemnification just on the ground, how, how is that playing? I mean, I know projects by project by project. We all hear about projects in our communities by project. How is that, how, how is that being received and how is that working with your staff in dealing with uh, applications? Well, I think it's pretty well um, accepted now that the Commission is going to take this approach with new development. Uh -huh. uh, we have yet to really um, s have a legal challenge to that approach. Okay. Uh, you know, hopefully we won't have to have a legal challenge, but um, you know, we feel confident that we have put in place the right um, balance between public and private interests through those permits. And that really is, uh, I think, an important point from our agencies perspective to keep in mind. This came up in our commission hearing last week. Some commissioners asking about, well, what about the taking of public property because we have hardened shorelines of private development and how do you deal with that challenge? We're trying to strike a balance whereby we recognize the um, private, pr private property interests and the need to maintain those interests but also provide for the public resources that are being impacted by the fact that that development's in this inherently hazardous location. And then just a la lastly a comment. Uh, these pictures are worth a thousand words and more because I think that is, that is the thing that tells the story in the best way. Uh, and, and my last comment is I, I thank you for your critical work over the decades to try uh, and make sure that we are being responsible. It's, where it's hard is case by case and dealing with past uh, pre-Coastal Commission developments as things happen and they become enforcement issues. And then on the other side, the applications for new development and uh, you're keeping the broad view while many of us at local government advocate for this project, not for that, talk to you about enforcement stuff. I mean, you know, that's the day-to-day -day stuff, but uh, I just want to tell you yet again, I appreciate the overview perspective that you continue to have to keep uh, on our behalf. So, thank you. Thank you. May I just make one observation related to that, which is that's another good point about why LCP planning is so important, because it gives us that opportunity to step back, look at all the incremental decision-making that we've been doing, and put it back into a more logical context going forward. So Solana Beach now is trying to bring all of its homeowners into the same set of rules going forward and sync up some of the decisions they've made in the past. Not easy, not, not easy but it needs to be done. Thank you. Mr. Quirk. Uh, <clears throat> coming, uh, first of all, I just wanted to second all of Assemblymember Atkins' uh, comments. And uh, a picture is worth a thousand words coming from a uh, uh, bay rather than a coastal county. Um, I hadn't seen this before and I found it very educational. Thank you very much. You're uh, if there are no further questions, uh, uh, Dr. Lester, let me thank you and um, acknowledge that um, uh, you know, we've got some real serious planning work to do and, um, and when I left the uh, Three years ago, the San Mateo County Board of Supervisors, we were just trying to finish up a local coastal plan revision. And interestingly enough, in that revision, there was really no addressing of the currently built environment. We were looking more at the planning uh, horizon um, in that document and not looking at what are we going to do with what's already built there. Um, so there's uh, uh, even LCPs that are, have been recently updated, many of them, uh, don't necessarily uh, reflect the challenges that you uh, brought to our attention today around, uh, you know, what, what are we going to do and what decisions will we reach around what's currently built and, and the infrastructure and, and the private development. So uh, huge challenges ahead and appreciate uh, the, your work and the work of the Commission in this regard. So thank you. Thank you. I do have uh, one last observation, which, um, you know, I said to the Hoover Commission also, I, I think we have a robust set of agencies, concerned agencies, and strong policies and law to deal with this issue. So I don't think we need to do new, <clears throat> new agencies, new programs, new institutions. We need to invest and support the agencies we have, uh, including the agencies that your, your other agencies that are here today. So thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Lester.